Well, John likes to refer to it as a love story in a very human sense. And, and a relationship of habit, um, uh, two people who have been together, who, um, who, who have the potential or the possibility of finding love and yet have not yet been able to, to go the distance or been able to find it, you know. And whatever those dynamics are, whether it's their, the, uh, the political uh, or social situation that they're in, that they're homeless in a sense, that the potential for having, having a life has diminished over the time of the relationship. So we have moments within this where we, we, these people have gotten lost in some way, lost in the world, lost in their world, which has not, uh, uh, not for, been fulfilling for them. And, um, and that relationship has become uh, very dangerous, uh, and it's become uh, a very painful relationship for both of them. Their love has been distorted by uh, circumstances that I believe they feel are beyond their mm -hmm. their control mm -hmm. or out of their hands. Mm -hmm. But um, I, th I, hopefully, what we'll find at the end is that you do, you can decide to be conscious about. Um, about your life and the choices that you make, mm -hmm. there's things that you can, there are things that you can't mm -hmm. control, but um, it doesn't have to distort you to the point that it makes you uh, just animals or animals, less than uh, human. Exactly, less than human. You know, and I think what happens, you know, and, and Andrew says that they find themselves, they find their humanity at the end. Mm -hmm. I think that's the story that we want to leave with, you know, and in fact. Um, it's almost a, a new beginning, a beginning for them. Mm -hmm. And the yeah. possibility and the of love of, and, of respect love and respect and dignity. And dignity. Yeah. These mountains out there in the old days, so clear at times. I haven't seen them in a long time. Bozeman's back gets in the way these days. I, I think part, part of it. Part of this is what we find it very interestingly, interestingly woven is the fact that that women are, constitute the foundation or the in which societies are built, in a sense, which is the home, the community is built. The fact that she finds joy in the midst of uh, some joy, some sort of happiness, some sort of redemption in the midst of all this turmoil and, and all this, this uh, deprivation. So in that sense, her, her, her role is, 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 is somewhere, in a positive sense, is almost the antithesis of what, what Bozeman feels or wants to feel. He is so beaten down by the system that it angers him and it distorts him even more to see that she's able to hold on to her, her humanity. Yeah. So he wants to forget it. So the process of going on a journey is one of remembering. Because once you go on a, a journey, you remember your history, remember who you are, what that road has been. And, and to, to keep her down and not allow her to remember that journey is a devastating, one of his devastating, devastating tools that he uses in, in, in keeping this overpowering her. And the thing is about power, and overpowering her physically as well as mentally as well. Mm -hmm. But what's so wonderful about her is that she finds her blessing in, in very simple things. Mm -hmm. As she says, when she speaks of warm times, yeah. she finds a blessing in a good walk on a nice day. Yeah, or a flower. Know, or a flower, yeah. on, on work. She yeah. says work, digging for crumbs. Yeah. How you sweat. And, and sweat. You, you know, you, you see those changes happening in your body. And then she says, and a good dance. That's mm -hmm. a warm mm -hmm. feeling. Mm -hmm. She finds them in very simple things. She's able to see joy and, and good times and warm times and mm -hmm. a, a feeling that makes you light. Yes. And yeah. he's forgotten that. He's forgotten how yeah. to do that. No, you two never get out of character, which drives me nuts. And it's wonderful. It's absolutely wonderful. I think sometimes preparing for, for a character, actors and actresses have their own little moments and own little secrets, you know. And, and it's the beauty of doing such a great piece of work is that you begin with just a little bit of something, and it becomes the key that creates something else, opens it up. And so one scene, becomes the catalyst for understanding the dynamics of something else, and so on and so on and so on. So you're always building, in a sense, and you live there. 
I think actors and actresses had a capacity to live in that moment than the truth of that moment because we're not only we've been trained to do that, but we have some sort of compassion for who these people. You have to have some sort of compassion for these people, not not to not to sentimentalize them in some sort of way, but to uh, uh, to in some sense have a way in which in which you 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 have empathy for them and you feel like you could, you you can wear their shoes and because and and be in their shoes and be who they are in a sense. So the clothes help, the uh, the, uh, the the situation help. The, the dialogue so helps, the, set helps, the self helps, and all that stuff to put you in there moment. And, and you don't leave that moment. You're there Go. in some sense. All right, stand by. Okay, thank you, Omarus. Roll it. Bye, everybody. Trim. All right, action. I'm warning you. I'm warning you. Take your stuff and go. I met John Barry really at the San Francisco Film Festival last year in April of 98. And I, because they were honoring him. And, mm -hmm. and I, I'm on the uh, advisory committee for that film festival. And I went to the event, saw the film, had a conversation with him, and told him how much I enjoyed the film. And what after film I was, was that? Tamango? Tamango. Oh, okay. Tamango, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I had, I had not, I, I mean, I, this is after um, um, Amistad had come out. And, Here's a film that's made 40 years earlier and had more to say about a slave revolt and the people involved in the slave revolt than I felt the film that I had just been made recently. And so I said, well, I had a conversation with him. And we talked about um, uh, things that he wanted to do. And the first thing he said, he wanted to do Bosman and Lena. And I said, whoa, I had never done the play before. I had never read the play. And I had never seen the play before. And, and I said, but I would be interested in, in becoming involved in it. He said he wanted to do it. Then I went to Paris, and I was involved. I was trying to put together, involved with putting together uh, a documentary about a black artist who, who lived in Paris and who became uh, famous in Paris and it had, had no notoriety, notoriety, particularly when they were here, but then certainly when they went to Paris and everything. Uh, they became important or visible in a different way. And uh, writers, artists, painters, musicians. And so we had the idea to talk to John Barry about it. Because he's been in Paris since 1951, 52, since the early 50s. And he had run into some of these, these, mm -hmm. these artists and some of these people. I mean, mm -hmm. legendary people for me, when you talk about Richard Wright, I mean, here's a man who sat with him and talked with him, you know. Mm -hmm. and, um, and you know whoever they were, and so I went to to uh, interview him about that, and he says, "Well, let's go out. Let's go to dinner. Who does he bring to dinner? Francois and Pierre." And it began there. I we play phone tag. Uh -huh. I call Paris. Uh -huh. He tried to reach me. Uh -huh. He called. He called the United States. I don't reach him. We <laughs> kept this whole that whole phone tag. So I, had, I went to the FESPACO, the film festival in Ouagadougou. And on the way back, I had a six hour layover in Paris. I called my assistant. I, I said, Sarisa, why don't you tell John that when I get to Paris, I will give him a call and we sit down and I'll break the news to him gently that I really don't feel like I'm gonna do this movie. That's, the, that's what I had in my oh, mind. <laughs> that's what I had uh -huh. in my mind. I had in my mind that I really... The plot thins. You know, <laughs> I really didn't want to think I wanted to do this movie. And, mm. and, and, I, and I really... And I was, I was ready at a point where I needed someone to say some magic words. That's what mm. I needed, someone to say some magic words. Because I had, I had, I had done a movie in, in Beloved, and I... I thought I shot one movie, 
And when mm -hmm. I looked on the screen, it, it wasn't was... the same movie I shot. You mm -hmm. know, and, mm -hmm. I, and that kind of disappoints you in mm -hmm. a way, in a mm -hmm. way, because you you put so much energy into it. And so I was kind of, I mean, I, I enjoyed the movie. I enjoyed. I had a great time working on it, and I enjoyed what I saw. But it wasn't a movie. It didn't have the texture of the movie I thought I shot. So. Uh, when I got to the airport, when I arrived in Wag from Ouagadougou to Paris, went through customs, who's there standing at uh, the gate but the three musketeers? <laughs> John, Pierre, Francois. The big, John, John's like this coat on and everything. And I, that, for, for, for someone of, of, of John's advanced age to be up at six in the morning to do this, moved me in, in, in a different way. So I said, well, let me have breakfast with him and talk about, just talk about the script. Let me talk about the script and whatever, mm -hmm. what I, the issues I have with it, some things I feel concerned about the script and everything else. And I got there and I started talking about the script and I waited for his response. He waited for a second and he took about 10 minutes and he talked for 10 minutes about what he saw in the vision. Mm -hmm. And I sat for a second, and I said, I'll see you in South Africa. And I, want, I, and I said in this word, I want to go on this journey with this man right here at this moment. I want to go on this journey with him because I think that in, in going on this journey that we'll all be enriched by going on this journey, you know. And all of a sudden, all the feelings that I had had at that particular point of being, uh, of seemed to dissipate all the kind of feelings of what had happened with Beloved, uh, the feeling about what do I do, uh, do I not do anything, and not feeling like I really wanted to act. And that's part of what it was, and I wanted to do it, because I didn't feel like I wanted to act right then. Mm. I mean, it was past the point of, of all the other stuff. I'd done the lethals, and that's finished, or whatever. So it becomes more about, in this, this next phase, I hope, in my career, about doing the stuff that I really want to do you know, for the most part, and stuff that gives me some sort of joy and some sort of sense that I've, I've made a commitment to what I believe I came into this thing to do. And ultimately, in, in a very idealistic way, in my own idealism, I came into acting believing that I could change the world by, by, doing that, by doing that craft and doing the kind of work I wanted to do. It's the same reason why I began with an embrace for God. Had not I embraced for God 25 years ago, I possibly would not have been able to develop as an actor the way in which I developed, or may not have been even interested in acting had not Fugard come along. I was in New York and uh, finishing up a project, came back, and then Ren, who yeah. we know, yeah. um, called and said, Sister, I got, I got this call, Peter Andrews, who, uh -huh. who I think wrote Sisters, which uh -huh. was a movie of the week, television mm -hmm. movie that John directed, uh -huh. that I had seen and really loved, that had Irene Carr, Diane Carroll, and Rosalind Cash. Okay, and all right. And a three-hander with those ladies. Yeah. And uh, really enjoyed that. And of course, I had seen Claudine, Claudine yeah. you know, yeah. and, and loved that. And um, so uh, I guess uh, John had contacted Peter. Uh -huh. Peter contacted Wren, knowing that how close Wren and I are. And Wren uh -huh. told me, and usually he tells me nothing. People ask him, send him, or whatever. Yeah. And he said, no, no, that's mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. that's not our uh -huh. relationship. You can't get to her through me. But he felt something in the possibility of this happening. So uh, we met at the Thai restaurant up in uh -huh. Larchmont, uh -huh. Pierre okay, and Pierre. John. <laughs> and I couldn't understand a word <laughs> Pierre was saying. I was straining, but that French accent, uh -huh. I was like, I couldn't understand. Him. Uh -huh. But we sat there, sat across for them, from them, just talking, relating. He told a lot of his stories. You know, John has yeah, a, yeah, a yeah. thousand and one <laughs> stories. You know, and um, and I, I mean, I didn't know who he was. I knew I knew these two projects, and uh -huh. but as you say, as an actress looking at those projects, I'm looking at the work of the actors. Ex I'm not exactly. thinking about the director, and maybe yeah. that's a good thing because it, it when it disappears, when their hand disappears. But I'm really, yeah. I was really at that at that point concentrating on them and to find out that this is the man that directed mm -hmm. those uh, two pieces. Then to sit there and talk with him and he's so, he, uh, Claudine originally was with uh, Diane. Uh, uh, Diana Sand. Diana Sand. Sand. And uh, we brought that, brought, mm -hmm. we brought that up mm -hmm. and he immediately became just so filled and I, I mean I thought we'd have to 
just call it a night, but he began to talk about her and and how um, you know she said no, Diane Carroll mm -hmm. should do this, and but his just love you saw in the heart of this person for another human mm -hmm. being, mm -hmm. for this uh, woman who was incredible actress mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and beautiful mm -hmm. spirit and died far too young. Yes. But um, and we were just moved by that that compassion that yeah. we saw across the table began to talk about the story he had directed Bozeman and Elena 35 years ago with James Earl Jones and Ruby D yeah. you know yeah. both whom we've met and come to know and yeah. love yeah. you know so it seemed to be just a connection of, yeah. of work yeah. that we've seen of people we artists we've been aware of and uh, so so that was uh, that was certainly in the in the you know the plus column mm. and then I said well for Bosman, who are you thinking? He said Danny Glover, and he was going to see you. I think the next night in the play Johin that you were doing yeah. down at East West Playhouse. Uh. So of course I said, well, let me go see it. Also okay. came up to you, Danny. Is it true? Because yeah. you hear things, <laughs> Danny. Is it true? Are you doing this? Uh. He said, yes, I'm doing. It. I said. Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, I mean, I was, I've never done an accent before. I've never done Fugard before, yeah, 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 <laughs> you know, yeah. whatever. And of course, it's, you know, basically a two hander. Yeah. So I said, okay, well, if you do, I know you're familiar with it. And uh, I would feel, you know, uh -huh. s you know, safe, uh -huh. safe there, you uh -huh. know, having just met John and, um, you know, attempted to read it. Uh -huh. And, um, and, I mean, it just went back and forth for a couple weeks, just thinking, oh, this would be wonderful to do, but a little apprehensive because it really requires that you go to work and it's really going to be a challenge and you're really going to be all out there. And like yeah. you said, when you put all that out there, you know, um, uh, you just want it to be she put to it be all out there. to to be right. <laughs> it, <laughs> yeah, she put it all out there. <laughs> well, he's a little slouch, you know. <laughs> we have we have fun out there. Oh God. We do, we do. Yeah.